Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm here virtually with Patrice Lawrence, the author of Eight Pieces of Sylvia, and we're going to be having a great discussion this evening, talking about the book, and I'm going to ask her some more broad questions about writing. Um, and so I'll just run through housekeeping very quickly, and then I will jump on into my introduction. Um, so this event is part of the Wigtown YA programme and there will be younger viewers tuning in. So I just ask that everyone is very inclusive, PC, and that they mind their language and questions and comments, which I don't think there'd be a problem with anyway. Um, secondly, I just want to say be sure to donate. Um, if you're enjoying Wigtown Book Festival, it's been brilliant. I've been tuning into loads of events myself um, and it just makes such a difference if you can. Um, and also be sure to go to the festival bookshop, which you can find online, and pick up a copy of Eight Pieces of Sylvia. Um, I promise it's exceptional. I devoured it. I'll go into more detail in a while. But yes, do check out the festival bookshop. Um, and finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Hollywood Trust and the Scottish Children's Lottery for making this event possible. So now on to the author herself, um, Patrice Lawrence. I feel like I wish I could just go like this to you in person. <laughs> um, it's so lovely to have you here and um, virtually joining us. Um, Thank so you. Patrice Lawrence was born in Brighton and is the author of six books. And she was brought up in an Italian Trinidadian household. So her first novel, Orange Boy, won the Waterstones Book Prize for older readers and the YA Book Prize in 2015. And it was also shortlisted for the Costa Book Award. And then her second novel, Indigo Donut, won the Crime Fest Best Fiction, Best Crime Fiction for Young Adults and was shortlisted for the YA Book Prize in 2018. Um, and her other books include Rose Interrupted, Driver's Daughter, A Tudor Story, which is brilliant. I also read that yesterday. Um, and Granny Ting Tig and Toad Attack, which is published by Barrington Stoke. Um, so it's especially good for slightly younger readers who might be struggling or who have dyslexia. Um, Barrington Stoke are, are brilliant, are really good publishers. Um, and she has also been shortlisted for the Carnegie Award three times. So it's quite an introduction. <laughs> um, and it's, it's brilliant. Um, so Eight Pieces of Sylvia um, is the latest book that we're going to be talking about. Um, and it's the story of Sylvia and Bex. So they're two stepsisters whose parents have gone away on honeymoon to Japan. And then Bex goes to open Sylvia's door to ask her stepsister if she'd like to come out or she wants to have some food with her. And she finds that the room is empty. Only the cat is inside and he walks out. And so the story unfolds. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a why done it. I read a really good description of it that, that said that it was like that. And it's not, 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 not so much who done it, but you're working out why all the pieces fit together. Um, the characters are extremely warm hearted and so likable. I was laughing by page three. Um, I honestly could not get over um, the comedic weight of it. I, I, there were so many points that I was underlining and laughing. And I was like, I need to write this down and use some of this humor myself. Um, but yeah, the book is twisty and it, it always kind of apprehends you at just the right place when you're like, hmm, what's going to happen next? And then it changes slightly. Um, it's always empathetic um, and it tackles a load of topics in the most natural way. That's one thing I really loved about it. It tackles grief and um, LGBTQ plus kind of things and family dynamics and friendship. Um, and I love the equal measure that Patrice gives all of them. Um, I thought it was very eloquently written. Um, so that is my huge <laughs> introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so my first question was, um, how did you come up with the characters of Bex and Sylvia, the two protagonists? I suppose for me, sort of a book is almost like a stew, and there's always like loads of different ingredients that I want to put in, and then I spend ages going around on buses, letting them percolate in my brain for <laughs> ages. So I kind of knew I wanted to write a mystery because I love crime novels, uh, and also I watched loads of. Um, uh, sort of crime um, you know like crime series on TV like Criminal Minds and you know things where even if you guess who's done it you don't know why so yeah. I, so I kind of wanted to write something that had clues in it um, I always like to write about young people who aren't often represented in books so working class young people young people of colour 
And I'd been asked, you know, in schools a couple of times, am I going to write an LGBT character? So I really wanted to write a young black working class lesbian who's out because the coming out story isn't my story to tell. So I wanted somebody who's been out to her family. That's not an issue. But also to show that even if you are happy in yourself, sometimes you have to be wary about what's outside and about other people's reactions. I wanted her to have love <laughs> as well. Um, but also I think I've never, you know, I always write families that are very different. So my stepdad's Italian, but he brought me up since I was four. So and he's always referred to me as his daughter, but he looks very different from me. He's like very short and very fair. So <laughs> people were like, like really? <laughs> they look at me and him. And I've got two brothers who are like, Angelo is their dad, but they're very different colours as well. So we're like this multicoloured family and I've never lived in a family where we're all the same colour, you know, I've never lived with my biological dad. So for me, that's the norm. So, you know, all these things go in there. I'm kind of interested in siblings about how they, you know, how they interact. And also my biological father died in quite tragic circumstances when I was in my um, early 20s. So I thought about how you hold grief and the people that you don't tell and how you, what you lock inside you. But then also I wanted to add my absolute nerdness to it. So Black Panther, Korean pop music, loads of different things. <laughs> you know, just put it all in and give it a big stir and see what it ends up with. Oh, and with a bit of obsessive love as well. <laughs> so I, I need the ingredients. It was just making them work. Yeah, no, and, and they all come through really strongly in it. Um, I actually love what you were saying about grief and how you how characters hold grief. Um, that's really true. And that's something that's done so eloquently and kind of subtly in the novel in that like when you're reading it you're, you're not reading it at all like this is a character who's suffering from grief um with Sylvia um but it's it's there ever so slightly with her mother's death it's sort of plastered into her character and and it's really lovely because Bex uh her stepsister is incredibly empathetic as a character like it's one thing that really struck me when I was reading it like you're we're inside um Bex's head and we can hear when she thinks that that she's maybe overstepping a boundary or that she's not basically cutting Sylvia enough slack not being empathetic enough she kind of checks herself um and I thought that was really beautiful did, did you do that on purpose to kind of suffuse her with that empathy? I suppose I wanted I really wanted Bex to care and I wanted her to be kind of loud and brash and speak her mind but also that doesn't mean you don't care but I think you know sometimes when you're 15 and 16 it's it's hard to know what to do with that and hard to know what your role is you know so yeah, yeah. I really wanted her to be empathetic and I really because um and I think also part of it was modeled slightly with my um uh, me and my daughter so I was sort of a single mum for for a time and we're just very very close so I just think about our relationship with each other and sort of put a lot of that in there as well. The times that she was very empathetic uh, towards me, even though she was sort of, you know, relatively young. And I think, you know, people often do um, young people a disservice because I think young people are often very empathetic, very caring, you know, um, very tolerant. And I think we forget that. And I just kind of wanted to plough that back into Bex. I wanted a loudness and a K-pop and you know, all of that and a friendship group. But I just wanted her to care as well. Yeah, and I love that. I think you did such a great job with that. Um, and you're right about kind of often thinking that young people can't be so kind of empathetic and intense in a good way because that's that's um, a characteristic that's used to just or a descriptor that's used mm. for Bex, who's one of her friends says that she's sometimes a bit intense. And Bex immediately Googles. She's kind of like, <laughs> what do intense people do? Um, which I thought was brilliant as well, the way actually it leads me to my next question. But the way you you wove in Instagram and Google and just kind of the modern ways that teenagers interact with the world. And um, it was done very fluidly because sometimes you read things and it can feel a bit awkward. It's kind of like we're putting the obligatory I use Instagram in here. I liked her post. It didn't read like that at all. It was kind of just like a third arm. It was another way of flowing through, you know, as as teenagers. Um, and I wondered how you were such an adept at that. Like, how are you so media well, fluent? I, I asked my daughter <laughs> a lot of the time, but also, I mean, as a as a sort of writer, you've got to learn to promote yourself as well. So I've had to get quite familiar with, you know, well, I suppose with Inst- I love Instagram anyway. I just love people's pictures of their dogs and puppies it makes me very happy okay. um but also you know I, I did sort of ask my sort of daughter about uh, you know what she would use and 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 how 
And I think and I think I've kind of slightly learnt my lesson with Orange Boy though, because um, Sonia, one of the characters of that, has a blackberry. And like by the time it's published, nobody has. <laughs> So I'm just hoping that, you know, some of the things you put in there are going to have some longevity rather than people going to be looking at it five years time like, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, no, it's it. true. Um, and I think it, it makes it, it makes it very appealing as well. Like I just sank into the novel immediately. I was like, oh, this is like talking to a friend. Um, and I, I have heard like uh, your books described as being similar to Jack Ring Wilson in that, that method of like being able to tackle like quite big issues and doing it in such a, such a kind and kind of like empathetic coming down to your level way and um, that you actually get to the kind of the meaty stuff really quickly so what you were saying earlier about about tolerance and about how young people are very tolerant that immediately hit me um when with Bex has a group of friends she's got this amazing group of friends mm -hmm. they're all extremely like loud and they have their own opinions and, and they're all very strong characters and reading them feels like walking into a room and you're already like oh I'm, I'm one of these you know I know them I can get into k-pop um it I really love that about it um but they're all extremely tolerant of each other you know like they, they start joking about one of the characters is saying like oh what would happen if I brought a girl home like my mother wouldn't allow that and then Bex is kind of thinking oh what would happen if I brought China home um, and I thought they're incredibly tolerant in how they're thinking like they're and that's really good to see that reflected Um, so is is tolerance like is that something that's very important in all of your work to get across or does it come I think it, I think, think at times I think I sort of cheated slightly because I think a lot of those were in a sense based on some of my daughter's friends because I'd often come into the kitchen and they will be chatting away. I remember once actually I was downstairs eating a sort of um, watching TV and they all came in we were eating the pizza and I said let's just say to them like do you really want to discuss that in front of me? And they said we're not being rude Patrice. I said I know you're not being rude but you're not going to end up in a book. So you know they, her, her friends are so lovely so it's kind of sort of scooping off bits of their life to put into to books and maybe not all you know young people are like that but a lot of the ones that I've you know I've come across are very thoughtful and caring and I really wanted to show the side particularly also young people of colour and sort of sometimes you see sort of um, black girls on buses and people think they're just really loud and that's all they see of them and actually they've got all these different sides to them and yeah. a lot of that is a very sort of you know very caring very tolerant really thoughtful and very loyal side as well so I wanted to sort of portray all of that as well as of course doing dance routines to Blackpink the uh, sort of k-pop girl band I thought that was very important. Yes I, I agree um, it definitely came through in the book and I love that uh, and I want to ask you more about that I didn't know about k-pop before um, I read <gasps> a piece of Shit. yeah no <laughs> no it was a, a brilliant awakening honestly um, and also um, you've made a Spotify playlist of songs that influenced you when yes. you were writing I had such fun going through all of those but I wondered <laughs> if you could tell our audience who we can't see um, a bit about making that part or making that playlist and also just about how music inspires you when you write I think music means a lot to me and I think music in many different ways so there's a time when you sometimes turn on a radio and a song that you haven't heard for many many years comes on and you realize you know all the words or songs that take you back to particular places or particular moments or songs you've got to turn up as soon as they come on and find yourself singing along and um, so sort of when I sort of wrote the, the playlist, I actually wrote an article to go with it uh, right, about um, the various songs and what they, they mean to me and, and why. And it made me think about when I sort of, actually, I heard a song on the radio today by Wham, the sort of band that George Michael was in when I was a teenager. Amazing. It just made me think of like making, you know, trying to dance along with it to them on this the sort of TV. And I think things never change. So it's my daughter who sort of taught, uh, showed me sort of K-pop quite a few years ago. Before that, she was into sort of J-pop, the Japanese version, suddenly sort of K-pop mm -hmm. sort of came on. So it's kind of, you know, because uh, I love pop music anyway. So I sort of watch some of the songs and talk about them. Um, and I think BTS, which are the biggest sort of K-pop band, are now got a song that's in English which is on radio too all the time you know like <laughs> when I was sort of making my soup it was on you know it's on in English and you know they are incredibly hard working you know when I look at some of the choreography videos like, how do you manage to jump all at the same <laughs> at the same time and oh, get a leg to do that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just thought, so thought it's really interesting but also in terms of k-pop about you know what the best music does is it just unites people from lots of different backgrounds so yeah. when P, uh, BTS played in, in, I think, Wembley, you know, my daughter was saying, there's everybody, you know, 
older, younger, black, white, you know, lots of uh, Muslim girls, you know, a real mix of people. And I think music can do that and that joy of when you're all there singing along to a song that you all, you know, yeah. love and feel the same thing. So for me, music does that. It just sort of binds me with lots of different people in lots of different places. So I love to give that to my characters. Yeah, oh, I love that. That's really beautifully put. Um, and it comes across again in the book as well, in the way that they have this instant shorthand with each other, the yeah. characters, when they're yeah. referencing the same music. And then, then like, I was looking up that music and I was like, oh, I, I could be in, in this friend group for sure. Um, and then, yeah, when they're learning dance moves as well, I was like, how long would it take me to teach oh, myself? No. <laughs> <laughs> and how much arnica would I need to use afterwards for the bruising? <laughs> Agreed. Um, but yeah, I would really encourage everyone to check out the Spotify playlist that you've made. It's called Eight Pieces of Silver as well. Yeah. Um, and you can just link them. But um, but yeah, it's it's really nice to listen to that and then think about the book after you've read it. Um, so yeah, thank you for answering that question. Um, and the next... so I just the, the one other thing about that was um, the uh, Janelle Monet track. Um, yeah. Because part of it as well, when I was sort of reading it, and I, I sort of was thinking about what would be the particular references for a young black lesbian, but who would be the people that you would think would be your role models, you'd think, oh yeah. yeah. And then sort of Janelle Monet was one of those. And the video to that song, uh, is it Queen, isn't it? Is actually it's got Erica Badu, it's all in black and white, really good production values. <laughs> it, but it's also a song about tolerance and being a bit different, um, but just really empowering as well. So yeah. No, it's so important, as you were saying, to the, to see role models in Absolutely. in music and in writing and in everything. And I think as well, in your book, you've created new role models as well. It's this great power in seeing yourself or who you want to be yes. reflected somewhere else. Yeah. Um, did did you actually have any any authors when you were younger that you looked up to, or or did you see yourself reflected in any way when you were younger? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, th- I was a real compulsive reader. And I was just thinking about it today and thinking about, in a sense, as a child, most of the books I would have read would have been like the equivalent of historical novels because they're either written mm-hmm. like Bedwardians or Victorians or they're like they're set in Tudor times. So there wouldn't have been anything contemporary yeah. until um, when I was in what would be the equivalent now, year nine. So it would have been like second or third year of secondary school. And our English teacher um, did... Uh, Oh, The Pig Man by Paul Zindel, which is kind of like a, I suppose it's the equivalent of American YA, really, about teenagers. And I'd never before read a book about teenagers. So I went to our local library in Haywood Seath, that was fantastic. So I read all the Paul Zindels, they read all the Essie Hintons, all this sort of like the outsiders and rumble oh, yeah. And I think they just stuck in my head and percolated. Um, it never occurred to me that black people could be in books or write books that were in bookshops because we just weren't there. Um, I see like Fluella Benjamin on Play School, which is great because you're like Trinidadian, you know, black woman. But but that was it. It just and literally it took me until my 30s before I wrote books that had black characters in them because that had so sunk into me that, yeah. you know, I had no right to be there or just not the possibilities of being there in a book. Um, and it didn't, it took until I was watching um, the BBC adaptation of Mallory Blackman's Pick Heart Boy. And um, we sort of turned I it on on BBC and, you know, and it was like, you know, a black family. And it's also like a English family. It wasn't like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or the Cosby show. It was like, oh, my. And suddenly, literally, it was like this door opened because I just thought, you know, my multicoloured, interesting <laughs> immigrant family and, you know, yeah. we're important. We can be in books. I can write about the things I care about and the, the things that I know in that sense. And I actually found my writing voice from from that completely oh, that's a, that's a really beautiful story um I think yeah there's such power in that moment like you said when you were like that's it like like my family has value and we can all write you know absolutely yeah um and, and also- I thought I'd be a full-time author so it's something I was doing in between all the other stuff and also I didn't right. really know any other authors to talk to about it so it's just kind of going about your life, you know, trying to get yourself to work, your child to school, come home, cook something healthy, you know. So yeah. I don't think I don't think I, I gave it much thought in my mind. And I think even now though, it still feels incredibly weird if I go into a bookshop and I see my books in there because it doesn't feel that that's me. I'm still 
can't believe that I've done that. And I think it just takes a while. Well, I mean, my daughter was visiting her friend in Leeds a few weeks ago, and she took a picture of um, eight pieces of silver on the uh, table in the Waterstones in Leeds. I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> so, yeah. So it still feels, there's still this disconnect between seeing that, even though I sit here quietly, sort of muttering myself to myself, trying to write the books <laughs> and do the editing. And then I see it in a shoe shop, it's like, really? That's me. <laughs> So, yeah, because because I guess it's such a private act in some ways. Writing, you know, it's just you in your in your dome of a mind, you know. And then suddenly that shatters and it's out. But you're still like, no, no, it's safely, it's safely in here. But that that's a book out there, but it has my name on it. But it's not quite the same. <laughs> yeah, it just feels unbelievable. I think you know the my, the sort of Waterstone stuff in Hayward Heath probably know my mum better than my mum knows me because she goes in a bite of books to send to family in Trinidad. So. But yeah, it is. It still, it still feels odd. But it's still, still hard. You know, every book is still hard to write. But there is still that lovely moment when I got the boxes of sort of like eight pieces of silver. It's all glossy, and I opened it like, oh yes. yes. <laughs> so yeah, there still is that moment. My heart beats with joy when a book comes. I think, oh my gosh. Oh, and that. so it should. Yes. Um, and I actually wanted to ask you about um, writing courses and retreats, because I did read that you got the idea for um, Orange Boy, which I actually have here because I was doing some reading, um, <laughs> uh, that you got that when you were on the Arvon writing retreat. Um, yeah. And I just thought that was interesting. I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about writing retreats and maybe their space and the writer's routine. I think for me, it was, um, I tried, I had an agent and I sort of, sort of submitted various books to her so it's about you know about 70,000 words you know it's like no not good enough to publish another 70,000 like no and this happened about four or five times I just thought I can't do this I can't write children's books I'm a bit rubbish so I just thought I'll go to the next thing you know I've read loads of crime I'll write sort of crime novel and a few couple of years before that I'd researched um, an old musical history of an old musical in Hoxton in East London and I've done loads of research about um Hoxton in the 1930s, sort of between the wars, and had this whole set of ideas about a uh, crime novel I was going to write there. So I got made redundant, had a little bit of money, um, and uh, decided I was going to go on an Arvon crime writing course that was on in sort of November. Um, so I went with like all my sort of notebooks and my plans. And so one of the exercises was that because you hide clues in sort of um, crime, so we had to pick like a, a sort of sentence out of a hat and then hide it in a paragraph. And then once you you sort of read it to everybody else and they found it. And my clue was uh, he kind of woke up dreaming of yellow. You know, so it sounds a bit abstract, a bit Mouth yeah. a bit Homer Simpson, you know. <laughs> and uh, and um, But then there'd been, um, my daughter just started in the first year of secondary school and there'd been um, a teacher strike two weeks before and I'm such a wonderful parent that I took her to um, Hyde Park Winter Wonderland instead of going to school. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so expensive. And both of us, you know, especially her, she's like tight. She doesn't like spending money. So we spent all the time going around that. What, six quid to go on that? Like, oh, that's, that's mad. I'm not paying that. I'm not scamming you. We had a great time. Done that. <laughs> it was really expensive. And also it's like those cash machines that tell you £2.25 like, to take out your own money to buy a hot dog. Like, nah, I'm not doing that. But we ended up buying one hot dog between the two of us because you managed to have enough 2p coins or something. And um, and I suddenly thought about yellow mustard. So I imagine this boy standing there and this girl who, you know, he really likes first date and she's putting mustard on a hot dog at a fair. But he hates mustard, but he likes her more. And because it's also a crime novel, they said, you know, like somebody's got to, it's got to be a crime. So I thought, OK, the girl on a ghost train come out and she's dead. I was never going to write it. And I thought, oh, my gosh. So I eventually wrote it, but also I never knew that YA existed. So I thought it was just a crime novel. And somebody said, oh, I'm really pleased you're writing YA. He's like, it's YA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've read books I like Patrick Ness, so, you know, but I just didn't put it in a separate category. I just thought they were good books. Yeah. Um, so it was actually written by accident, but all that stuff must have been there in my head anyway, I suppose. But um, And it also took so long that... Um, I started writing it before the Olympics and where mm-hmm. I was living in East London at the time, it was like nine minutes cycle ride from the Olympics ground. So, and also in Westfield, when it runs through Primark was right where the Olympics was. So when I started writing it, you know, the building Olympics, as I was writing it, the Olympics came up. By the time I finished it, the Olympics had gone. Okay. So like, edit out anywhere. <laughs> 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 you need to write quicker. 
that's really nice so that you could sort of chart the two against each other I like that as an image it's really nice um, and that actually brings me on perfectly to one of my questions about setting. Um, London seems to be the beating heart of so many of your stories, or rather the beating heart location. Um, and I wondered what was it about or what is it about London that enamors you so or that draws the stories to it? I think there's a lot of mix of reasons. One is because, like, you know, didn't have much money when <laughs> I lived in London. Two, I spent a lot of my life on London buses. Um, when I moved to London in the early 90s, I lived... I didn't live near a tube and I lived near Greenwich and actually the way into town was the 53 bus. So mm-hmm. it's the way I orientated myself in, in sort of London yep. as well. Um, and also just listen to conversations. So a lot of, you know, when I listen to young people speakers quite often on buses and I've listened to sorts of really interesting conversations <laughs> I try to note down. <laughs> and uh, I remember once I was editing actually Indigo Donut on the bus because um, I'm classy like that. And uh, I could just hear these no, two... I love <laughs> These two boys sort of talking, it's like, yeah, mate, well, yeah, I got on a fight, you know, you got on a fight, yeah, it's a really bad fight, yeah, no. and I bottled him, mate, you bottled him, yeah, it's a Maltesers bottle, it's plastic, I'm like, what? <laughs> so, like, writing this <laughs> down, and then when they got off, you know, I thought they'd be like, a bit of a swagger, you know, a bit of a road man, but one was, like, really short, and then the other one was really tall and bigger, one I think was probably either African or Caribbean heritage, the other one I think was probably Vietnamese, I would never put them together, but I want to write about them. Amazing. <laughs> But yeah, so, but also I think for me, really important for me about London is like the London that never appears on like the films and TV programmes. You know, this isn't about Buckingham yeah. Palace or any of those things. It's about London with Londoners in it. And in mm-hmm. Indigo Donut, really, I wanted to, I did want to take them to Covent Garden and I wanted to take them to Dalston. But from the point of view for young people, and, you know, mm-hmm. if you think about a lot of the Richard Curtis films that have London in them, all of that, you know, all of sort of friends when they come to London, or even like Notting Hill and all of those things, you know, it's rarely ever any people of colour in them, rarely ever working class people. And I just wanted to create a London that looked like the London I see when I'm sitting in gridlock on a bus. Yeah, I love that. I think, again, you're coming back to your point of of writing in new characters so that new people will be looking at them and be like, I see myself there. Exactly. They're doing what I do. They're on my yeah. bus. You know, like yeah. there's there's such great power to be found in those moments. Um, they they really can be like a spark yeah. that that will ignite something in a lot of people. Um, I and mean, I was talking uh, just I mean before lockdown in February, I did an event in a women's prison in London, and I was talking about it. And a young woman said, uh, "Yeah, I know that bus because <laughs> you know, I live there, so it's lovely." It's Amazing. Like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah no I love it um, and I just had two more questions Um, one of them was I read that you were mentored by the BBC to be a comedy writer um, and it, it kind of it all clicked um, in my mind when I was reading because I was like there's such great comedy in this so I just wondered if you'd be able to talk about like kind of how you write comedy or where all that spark came from because it's it's hilarious I promise everyone it's really really funny from the description of the cornflakes who were like knocked over and um, looking like they were trying to commit suicide you said I was like that's great for knocked over cornflakes it works. <laughs> I do not have no idea um, I think also maybe slightly part of it is if I sort of grew up in a household you sort of when you grew up in an immigrant household so my stepdad speaks fluent English you know because he went so he was working class but he was one of the few people in his community who went to night school so he speaks fluent yeah. English uh, my mum's from Trinidad. So I think, in a sense, English is used slightly differently. So you get yep. used to slightly unusual similes, maybe, or, or metaphors. Like but also yep. just trying to find, sometimes if your experience is different from other people, just trying to find something that fits you. So mm-hmm. I think I've, I've done that. And also, you know, my, in, you know um, my, my daughter's dad, who's sort of, um, sort of white working class, guy from East London again tell stories which are incredibly funny you know my family in Trinidad you know so all tradition of people who tell really funny stories I suppose is what part of what I've grown up with so I think I've just used used to like wonky similes and funny stories and yeah. in the end it all sort of clashes together in, in books and I just again just love to give that originality to my characters I just think again the sense that particularly with Bex and she's got a really distinctive voice and yeah, you don't get that much in YA I think and also because I'm writing about you know somebody who's working class and somebody who's a lesbian and I felt a real responsibility about how I represented her and I really wanted her to be a sort of funny brave um you know sometimes slightly frightened but just wonderful young woman so I really yeah. wanted to give her the jokes 
as well. Yeah, because it gives her a lot of power as well, being able yes. to yeah. to make light of situations if she wants to. You know, she doesn't have to be meek and waiting for other people to kind exactly. of put their judgment on her. Um, because there, there's a great quote in the book. Um, it's it's near the beginning, so I'm not spoiling anything. But it it's when um Bex is speaking to a football coach. I won't say why. You can read the book and find out. But um, but he kind of makes a very snap judgment about um a picture of somebody that Bex shows him, and he he just kind of dismisses it or decides something. Um, and then at the end of the book, it ties together nicely when Bex reflects again. She's like, I don't want to be like that that coach mm-hmm. she would make snap judgments about people and I think the book in general it, it's all about kind of like what's underneath and and not making those snap judgments you know if you describe the book one way to to someone they might think that oh it's the book is maybe trying to make a point about something but it's it's not it makes its point by by the characters being real and by them living their life and being like this is our our every day you know and this is our strength and kind of this is us not making those snap judgments um, it's also about being allowed to make mistakes as well, isn't it? You know, and I think, you know, we can't, we can't be perfect. And I think with, and I suppose one of the sort of premises in a sense for the book was what happens if obsessional love meets somebody who's obsessed with people falling in love with them. So what yep. would happen then? And I think in a sense, that's what Bex has got to deal with, which is quite a lot. <laughs> Yeah, no, I find that really interesting as well. Um, when I read it, I wasn't expecting all of that. And I was like, oh, um, but yeah. And then how it ends is is twisty and, and brilliant and uh, perfect cliffhangers. But um, but yeah, so I might finish up my questions now. Um, and I wonder if you would like to read a little bit or if we would start taking some questions from people. Would you like to read a little bit? Oh, it's literally like 90 seconds from me. Yeah, that's it. From the beginning, I was just saying. So, so I just love this cover design by Michelle Brackenboat. <laughs> so, I share it's sort of really glossy, you keep stroking it. <laughs> so, uh, Bex, Mum said, fix up. Don't complain. Just fix up. We've been clearing up after you for 15 years. They ain't strictly true. Well, for Mum, it's true. But Justin's more recent. It's been seven years clearing up after me for him. Anyhow, I got home from school and found toast and marmite balanced on the edge of the table. The cornflakes box knocked over like the cereals trying to escape. Milk left out. It was like breakfast tried to commit suicide. I'd sent a message to mum straight away. Silver didn't do the clearing up. She's in her room sulking. That's when mum told me to fix up. When I replied, she said the plane's taking off and the steward's walking towards her with a look on his face. I know, Mum. She'll turn the phone off because she can never find flight mode and then shove it in the seat pocket in front. She won't turn it on again until her and Justin land in Japan. That's going to be more than 12 hours. I suppose I should leave them alone. It's the first few hours of their honeymoon. If it's still a honeymoon when you're heading out nearly two months after you got married. But Silver, though, I was a witness standing right next to her when she promised her parents she'd make sure I was good while they were away. She even looked them in the eye when she promised. But what's she done instead? She's left dying breakfast all over the kitchen for me to find when I get home from school. I don't want her setting that as a mood for the next two weeks. They're thinking about it. Even mush up cornflakes and bowed milk is better than some of the mood she's been cracking recently. Damn, it's going to be a long two weeks if Silver keeps a sulk up all that time. So that's the dying breakfast. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a perfect snapshot into like dive right into the book. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend that everyone goes out and reads this. Um, it's a book that you'll curl up with and you can just sit down for four hours with an endlessly large pot of tea and, and read and fall in love with the characters cause, and also get into K-pop. Um, that was my big take, <laughs> my second big takeaway from, from reading it. Um, so I'm just waiting for some questions to come through here. And um, so while I'm waiting for them to come in, um, I had one or two more that I just wanted to ask. Um, one of them was um, more generally about your writing, but um, and you kind of answered this earlier, but what were your favourite books as a child? I know you, you mentioned S.E. Hinton and you mentioned another author whose name I just missed. But, um, or Zindel, have- yeah. I think as a child, it was an interesting because I didn't live with my mum for the first four years because um, she was the second youngest of 12 but she was the only one who came to England when she was just like 19 or 20 to train to be a nurse. So I'm like every Caribbean cliche, like, you know, daughter of nurses. Um, 
But she, I always say she became pregnant and that's not right because it sounds like she did it by herself. But my dad had come over from um, uh, the Caribbean as well to train to be a nurse. So they're both training to be psychiatric nurses and they met and um, my mum became pregnant and um, they split up before I was born. So my mum had a choice to either send me back to the Caribbean to be looked after by aunties or to be adopted. But I was uh, privately fostered for four years and my mum continued her training. So I had a great old time. You know, my foster family was lovely, you know, taught me to read, joined the library. And because my mum was a big reader as well. So the way that we bonded were when I went to live with her again, and she would, she'd read books and then give them to me. So she liked all the classics like Heidi and uh, Anna Green Gables. And, but Wind in the Willows is my favourite, I think. You know, you can't beat a talking badger. So. No, I agree with Wind of the Willows. I've read that book many a time. And um, the the camaraderie and the fun that they yes, get up to on both. Absolutely. Honestly. But it's one, it's it's one a, cha- I mean, it's one chapter that I always really like. They'll talk about in schools. It's a chapter where Mole, because he's run out because he doesn't want to do his housework, which is so relatable. Yeah. Um, but then he wants to go and see his burrow and he feels a bit embarrassed. He thinks it's a bit shabby compa- compared to rats. And that is really empathetic. And because our, we lived on a cul-de-sac and me and my mum were the only black people on the cul-de-sac. I mean, my neighbours are lovely. But, were, but the thing about our family was my mum and my stepdad weren't married, which was really rare at that time. So I was really worried that my friends wouldn't want to come to my house because we were a sort of multi-ethnic house, great food, loud, interesting music. Um, but, you know, when I read Wind of the Willows, I thought, actually, someone's your friend, there's empathy. And my friends didn't care. You know, that was something. So that. books can teach you that empathy, can't you? So I love the books. Yes, that's... completely. And also, yeah, Raph helps Mole in the end. Yes, they get it all ready yeah. for Christmas. And, and it's food. Kind of it <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that, that's a really lovely scene. Um, and then um, another question is, um, I was wondering, how does um, the work, because I, I read that you did a lot of work um, for various charities before, and I wondered how that plays into your writing, um, or if that informs much of it. Very much so. I think, to be honest, I think a lot of the books came came from that, because I worked, when I was sort of um, in London, I worked for charities mostly around sort of social justice and equality, but I worked with uh, charities that worked with families who had children in care, um, did some research as I worked talking to young people being um, in care. I worked with uh, uh, organisations that work with families of prisoners. And so you kind of know that there are so many other different voices there. You sort of have one idea of prisons if you listen to the news. But actually, when you go into prisons, when you talk to the prisoners, when you talk to their families, you know, there's a whole different story there. So again, it's that sense about how you talk about people who are pushed to the edges and give them a voice so they can tell stories. So that's yeah, it's incredibly important to me. Yeah, and that and that really comes through in all of your work that I've read as well. Um, about yeah, stories again rising to the top that wouldn't always be given yeah. that voice. I think, um, so yeah, it's a very prevalent theme. Um, I wonder, do you have a favourite character from all of um the six books you've written thus far? Ah, I think. Um... Uh, a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I suppose there's different ones in Orange Boy. I really like Tish, who's uh, Marlon's best mate. She's like the 15 year old I wanted to be. Sort of great hair, no spots, loyal, and got a big mouth on her. But yeah, perfect. You know, I was quite spotty and into Bruce Springsteen. Um, in so in together, wrong actually, with Bruce. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> in Indigo, actually, I love both the characters. I love Indigo for what she represents. She's got a, such a, a sort of spark. You know, they're both into Blondie, and also Bailey is just kind and sweet and wants to do the right thing. But I just love Indigo because she's had a lot of stuff chucked at her really, and a lot of stuff to deal with, and she's like pushing through it. And I think also for her, you know, she at the beginning she thinks she can't be loved and won't allow herself to love, and by the end of it. She, she will and can, so I just love her arc. But she, I do think yeah. Bex is probably my favourite. You know, I can, I just could just see her in my head. You know, she's got a life way beyond that book for me. Yeah, no, I agree, and I felt like that when I read it too. I was like, I want to read more. I want to read just about like how Bex <laughs> kind of goes about life for the next ten years. Um, because yeah, just her voice and her being in her head is just so enjoyable. Um. And yeah, she's such a fully formed character, I think. She just yeah. like pops right out of the book and you're like, oh, hello, should we go get some tea together? Um, although she probably has some smarter things to say than that, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I wondered, um, more, just slightly more generally, um, kind of thinking about 
publishing and just recently there's been a lot of talk about it not being that accessible and it being harder especially for for black or minority ethnicity writers to to kind of get a place or in publishing and also more working class people and um, I even know sometimes being Irish and you can feel outside of the kind of London centric bubble that that is publishing and writing and um, did you feel that much um with with your process of like agent like going to an agent and getting published and stuff or I, th- I think it's interesting I think I I was in a sense was lucky because I got an agent before you had to write a fully polished book to get an agent because goodness knows how people do it now and I, I you know I do feel that there is a big a problem and I think class is quite a lot of the sort of factor and I think it's interesting that sort of publishing sort of is very similar to in a sense the charity sector where even though it's based in London it's still predominantly white it's still predominantly middle class um so most publishing meetings that I've been in to for the last five years um I've been the only person of color in that in that in that room so I think it still has so that means you've only got a certain set of points of reference really so some yeah. of the things that we'll talk about that specifically relating to my own identity and the things that have happened to me, even though, you know, I'm sort of British born and English is my first language and all of those things. I saw many people in those the room might not necessarily get. So that could affect the process through the whole of, you know, producing a book about how it's edited, how it's promoted, how it's marketed. If, uh, you know, many people in that sort of chain haven't got those points of reference. And I think, you know, it's really important we think about that because we think about in the last two censuses, so I always think censuses, is that a word? But in the last two censuses, it's censuses. <laughs> for instance, you know, it showed that for instance, um, particularly people of mixed heritage are a very a growing population. Um, they're much younger. So people, um, so, you know, we've got this whole amazing, you know, very diverse and its biggest word, potential set of readers there to read the books but their experiences aren't being reflected because as yet you haven't got so many people of that demographic in the publishing industry which is such a pity and we're sort of missing these opportunities to sort of tell so many different stories. Completely yeah I heartily agree and that's very well put um, about how it's still there's an effect that needs to trickle down um, and and books like Eight Pieces of, of Sylvia are, are answering that. There's a lot of people who will gravitate towards that and that'll help them, I think, step up a bit faster and be like, this is possible. Um, yeah, so I think, again, the book does really well in that respect. Um, also part, I have... suppose also, part, I suppose also just part of it was just to also to enable, to write a book like that, to enable young people have those voices, to know that their voices are important and they can write. You know, if people can list, if people can sort of study Chaucer and Shakespeare, they can read any pieces of silver, you know, to show that those voices, you know, those voices are important too and poetic and lyrical and should be in books. So you want young people to feel like they can write with their own voices and not pretend to be somebody else to, to write. Yes. Completely. I heartily agree. It's like when they translated, I mean, it's not the same, but when they translated the Bible to the vernacular because they were like, everyone should be able to read this. Yes, it's that same idea exactly. of like, yeah. everyone should be able to read in the tone of voice they want yes. to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if that gives them more power, then it's a no brainer that you would give everyone that capability. Um, sorry, that was a bit Absolutely, of a no. <laughs> Um, I have a question here from Aggie in Islay. I'm not quite sure where that is, but that's just me being Irish and not quite knowing. But um, the question is, do you think that writing YA fiction can be more challenging than writing for adults? I suppose that I think, sort of going back to Orange Boy, I never think of it as writing YA fiction. I just think of it as writing with younger characters. Um, and I, I, no, I don't really. I think there's so many things that I wanted to say and I think I really wanted to put those characters in those stories, in those situations. I think the only thing for me that's different if I was writing for adults is that with, with um, YA, I want to have hope. So even though a lot of them are in quite challenging situations at the end, I want there to be like a hopeful ending. So it isn't, you yeah. know, necessarily a fairy tale ending, it's just kind of weaving that through. And there's also certain other little things. So for instance, in Indigo Donut, Indigo and um, Bailey are 17, and they play tequila bingo on a bus. So basically, <laughs> the little egg cups, and every time they see a landmark, they will knock back some tequila. And the editor says, they're 18 now, so they're not, <laughs> they're not 18, so they're not leaking out to drink. So I just thought, I want to keep that scene. So I have to give them like the mother of all hangovers the next time. <laughs> so for me, there is actually there is also a certain responsibility. So for me, certainly around um, 
young women and agency over their own bodies comes up quite a lot and Indigo Donut and Rose Interrupted especially oh, and in I suppose um, in, in Beck so there's something about the messages that empower young people and what you're saying about identity and who you are feel incredibly important to me in, in sort of YA but maybe because of you know my own beliefs are important anyway and I think they percolate to anything that I write but I absolutely love it and I really love it when you go to school and you get you know it also talking about my my biological father who's ended up in prison for a month for um, forging a check and I talk very openly about it so you know quite often to get up young people who say oh yeah my dad's in prison and you know so it, again enabling you know just having a privilege to enable young people to see themselves in those books or to see the fact yeah. that me kind of working class black woman his dad was in prison you know gets to like do festivals and things like that so no I think I think why it wouldn't be more challenging than 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 adults just younger with a bit more hope <laughs> yeah oh I love that I think that that's such a lovely answer um I really like the hopeful aspect to it as well I think that's something that I dislike sometimes about reading adult yeah. like quote-unquote mm. fiction is uh, I want that hope I you know it's not yes. like you get to adult fiction and then it's definitive it's kind of like you're on this path for life so <laughs> oh, like no yes, I reject I that <laughs> keep going back to YA if that's how every adult yeah. writer wants to write you know yeah. um, you use like 300 pages you get to 300 and one's like oh my goodness really <laughs> Um, Thank you so much, um, Aggie, for that question. That was a a brilliant question. Um, And I just had a question um, about your writing routine. Um, I wonder, because I'm always just curious if people are like early morning writers or evening writers or writing whenever they have time writers. um, When do you like to write or when do you find time to write normally? I think initially because I, you know, because I was working, so I'd literally I'd write on the bus to work. I'd set myself a problem, I'd get character A to B, and I'd, and I'd worked out when I used to get the thirty-eight bus in London to to work that because the bus, the sort of second bus stop on a route was the one that I got, so there'd be lots of room. I could choose my seat at the top, you know, get out right. my stuff, and it was like an hour from my house to work to get an hour's work done. Okay. But I think I'm much more um, an early person. Um, I think that's when my sort of brain works. Um, so I get sort of writing down and I sort of swap between a sort of laptop and long hands if I can't think if I go get a notebook and a pencil it's like I'm thinking with a different part of my brain um so I can do that and also I'm just quite geeky so I love the research side of things as well so the great piece of silver I kind of watched a lot of k-pop videos it was terrible a lot of marvel films it was really awful so. <laughs> I bet in your mind you're trying to do the dance moves because that's what happens it, to me be my, I... it could only be in my mind <laughs> I'd break something if I tried it in real life. <laughs> I would encourage everyone to try and even learn 10 seconds of one of, of, of the videos that you've included in your playlist. I think it would be quite a feat. It could be put on TikTok, you know, just a little bit. <laughs> Somebody in a stretcher going to hospital, yeah. Hopefully not. Just maybe yoga warm-ups before <laughs> Um, but great I'm going to finish it up there um, Patrice it's been such a pleasure I've so Thank enjoyed you. speaking with you um, and I'm giving you a big round of applause from everyone else who's watching they're thank all doing you. it at home in front of their screens um, but yeah so thank you so much thank um, you. and I'll say goodbye thank Bye-bye. you everyone for tuning in Bye. bye